In this video, you will learn how to recognize changes with normal aging and what to do if you're worried that it's something worse like Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia. Also, be sure to watch until the end where I'll give tips on consulting with specialists. In this idea of normal aging and we all experience normal aging, there's often a concern for people of, well, am I aging normally or am I not aging normally? It can be really difficult to know. You've never been this age before. Everybody's a little bit different. You've had prior strengths and weaknesses. This all kind of evolves over time. So it's really difficult to know is what I'm experiencing normal or is it not? There are certain things that we associate with normal aging and the research suggests is really nothing to be concerned about. For example, with normal aging, we often see slowed processing speed. So the time that it takes for us to process or react to new information is longer. We often see more difficulty in recalling known words. You know, that sense of the tip of the tongue phenomena where you know the word and you're speaking along and then all of a sudden the word just doesn't come and it's much more of a challenge to express yourself fluently. You can have a harder time learning new information. So it may require that you take more trials of learning or that you be more hands-on in your learning process. And finally, there are often more challenges in multitasking. Remember when you used to be able to drive, listen to the music, know where you're going, and carry on some intellectual conversation at the same time? Well, that might be difficult to do simultaneously, and you might want to shut off the music and save those important conversations for later. So I have a couple of recommendations and tips for people who are somewhat worried or anxious about whether or not am I experiencing normal aging. First of all, I recommend that you pay attention to the things that you're experiencing. Start noticing when, huh, that didn't work the way that I wanted it to work or something was weird about that and hopefully even jot them down. So record this in a notebook, record this in some place where you won't lose it. Um, maybe even put a note in your phone if you're using that type of technology to just make a note. Here's the date and here's what happened. And it felt a little weird to me. So by recording these things and tracking them, you're going to be able to remember them a little more accurately. You can see the progression if you're having a progression of problems over time and you can share the data with other people when you want to. The next thing that I would recommend is that you interact with people you trust. Start asking them, hey, how do you think I'm doing? Am I having memory problems that you've ever noticed? Is anything unusual about what I'm doing or how I'm interacting with you? Has anything changed over time? And as I said, it needs to be somebody that you trust and that you feel comfortable with. Because if you choose somebody who might know you well, but maybe you have a contentious relationship with them, then it might be more difficult to parse out which piece of this is them telling you the honest truth about what they're observing and what's happening for you versus nitpicking something because of a bad dynamic between the two of you or something where they're a bit jealous or they're a bit unhappy with you to begin with. So picking somebody that you trust and that you feel like can give you some really honest feedback. Another component of monitoring and managing anxiety about whether I'm aging normally is to go to your primary care doctor. Now, ideally, you have a primary care doctor that you love. I want everyone to have a primary care doctor that they love, that they really, truly respect, they enjoy, that they feel connected to. If you don't have a primary care doctor like that, I would encourage you to try to make a change. One of the things that they might suggest is to do some basic labs and ruling out some of the things that can be wrong from um, an internal perspective of metabolic processes and so on can be really important because there are a lot of reversible causes of uh, problems with cognitive functioning that we can pick up on from a basic blood test. These are things like problems with folate or thyroid functioning, B12 or vitamin D. So all these different things that can be easily tested through a blood test or through a urine test if we're worried about having a urinary tract infection or some other type of infection, um, that these things can be easily screened for. And if there is a problem in that domain, easily treated. 
your provider may also have familiarity with different types of cognitive screens. Um, but these screens tend to be about 30 questions. There's several different versions of them. And your doctor or one of the assistants at your doctor's office may sit down with you and ask you these questions. And when we do these types of screens, it is a brief snapshot in time as to how is my brain working? This is not meant to diagnose a condition or a specific problem, but it's meant as a screening tool to give your doctor and give you a little bit of feedback. Does this look like you're functioning in a normal range or does this look more problematic? The last thing that I recommend with regard to easing anxiety about is my brain working correctly is to establish a baseline. Now this is really useful to have because as you go through life, your brain is operating in a certain way. Sometimes you're really good at something. Sometimes you've never been good at something else. You know, I, I talk to people who say, I've never been a good driver or I've never been especially organized. And so when you want to understand brain functioning later and to see if you're having a problem in different areas, sometimes it can be hard to parse out what things have you always had, what difficulties or challenges and what things are new. So I recommend that if we are worried about brain functioning, that we can establish a baseline. And you can establish a baseline in several different ways. One way is to establish a baseline of what your brain actually looks like. So these structural aspects of your brain and your provider can order this themselves, your primary care doctor, or you could be uh, referred to a neurologist and this would be related to taking a picture or having a sense of what does the structure or internal function of your brain look like. And so they might do a baseline MRI or a baseline CT scan of the head or the brain to document this is what it looks like now and to rule out any problems that might be apparent there. And then this baseline can be used for future comparisons. Very, very useful. Another way to establish a baseline is to undergo neuropsychological testing. And if you're interested in a detailed version of what is neuropsychological testing, what is it like, why would you do it, and what do you do with it, um, I'll have a separate video below in the link so you can check that out too. But the brief version is that neuropsychological testing um, doesn't do anything invasive. There's no blood work, there's no brain imaging, but a neuropsychologist or other appropriately trained professional will ask you to use your brain. They'll ask you to pay attention to things, remember things, come up with words, solve problems, all these different areas of brain functioning. And they'll document your answers and then statistically compare your performance to people kind of like you who are supposed to be aging normally. Often this includes people of your same age and education and other variables that might be of interest. When they do that, they can look for where are your strengths? We all wanna know what our cognitive strengths are so we can use them appropriately. What are our weaknesses? Of course, everybody has weaknesses. We wanna know those, but more specifically, are there any problems that don't look like they're associated with normal aging? And this isn't on any one test. Anybody can look out the window and, oh, squirrel, and be distracted for a moment. But what they're really looking for is patterns of problems. This then gives you a baseline again of what are my strengths and weaknesses? Do I have any pattern of problem we should be concerned about? What might be causing the problem? But then this can again be used in the future as a baseline. As a side note, you may not need a formal referral to be able to see some of the other specialists that you might want to collaborate with. For example, I'm going to see neurology or going to see neuropsychology, depending on your health insurance, a referral or a prior authorization may be necessary, but it's often not necessary. So I would not use that um, concern or fear that you might have to have a referral or the referral process might be complicated um, to stop you from looking into these types of collaborations and how these providers might be able to help you um, understand brain functioning. I also want to point out that um, insurance often will cover the cost for you to be able to see these various providers. So feel comfortable with the idea that you can ask beforehand, are these services covered and what would my copay be if I were going to work with you as a professional? 
all professionals or all of their offices should be able to provide you with information about how does your insurance consider this type of service and what would you owe at the end of the day. Wherever you are in the journey of aging and thoughts about your own brain health, think through the ideas we discussed and take one baby step toward feeling better about your own brain functioning. You might want to watch my next video on ways to feel better about your brain in the moment or skip ahead to science-based steps you can take to have a fit and functional brain. You only get one beautiful brain and I'm here to help you bring the science of brain health home.